Max, how are you doing today? Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Drew. This is amazing. <laughs> super excited to have you on, man. I've heard nothing but good things about you. Um, super excited to dive into your book and everything you've been up to because you have such a unique story. Um, and I kind of want to start off with uh, your media career because uh, I think that's what most people know you from. So let's start there and then how you transition into Genius Foods and that whole story. Totally. I feel like we have a lot of overlap in terms of our, our trajectories in this in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, began when I graduated college, I was uh, given an incredible opportunity to become a presenter and a producer of content for a TV network that former U.S. Vice President Al Gore had co-founded. It was called Current TV. And it was a it was a youth driven network. You know, all the people that worked there were uh, in their 20s and 30s. Um, but at the same time, the network had a very uh, strong social impact component to it. It really was about um, journalism and telling stories that uh, were being undertold at the time. And they hired me, actually, because I was a filmmaker in college and I made a film as an undergraduate that they felt really painted me as um, ultimately the kind of one man band uh, storyteller that they were seeking to empower. And so they they plucked me out of school to. Uh, basically anchor the network. And it was an incredible six years. I got to learn the best of the best journalists and storytellers, Peabody Award winning journalists. I mean, the network won uh, an Emmy and numerous awards. And so that was really what I got to do for six years. And in fact, the president of programming of Current TV uh, is known in the industry for picking unconventional talent that really um, are able to uh, Really rise above the top. So he is known for giving Anderson Cooper his first job. He gave Lisa Ling her first job. So that was sort of like my pedigree. That was like my entree into Hollywood. And after about six years of doing that, uh, I left, you know, really to change it up and to transition that incredible job into a career. And at that exact moment in my personal life, I started spending more and more time in New York City. I noticed along with my younger brothers that my mom was beginning to show the earliest symptoms of uh, dementia. And dementia was a kind of design, so I didn't even have the vocabulary to describe it, but she began complaining of memory uh, problems, brain fog. And we also noticed at the same time a change to her gait, meaning like the way that she walked. And I had no prior family history of any kind of neurodegenerative disease. Uh, and my mom certainly wasn't old, she was 58 at the time, um, very youthful, and so I couldn't chalk up what I was seeing to aging. And it really you know, left me at a loss. I, uh, it was a very confusing time, and ultimately I decided to go with my mom around the country to doctor's appointments. Uh, when we couldn't get a clear diagnosis in one hospital, we went to another, and ultimately it led to us visiting the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio and it was there that for the first time my mom was diagnosed with a neurodegenerative disease. And, uh, you know, I can tell this story now and sort of be, a, be at peace with it. Uh, but that was one of the most difficult weeks of my life. I mean, it was the, it was when for the first time I had a panic attack, uh, coming to terms with the fact that my mom had this condition that I knew close to nothing about. Um, and it was there that, yeah, I mean, I, I, I basically, uh, became unable to think about anything else but how my mom's diet lifestyle would have predisposed her to developing this condition. And I became obsessed with learning everything that I possibly could about how diet and lifestyle affect brain health and brain function and mediate our risk for some of humanity's most feared diseases like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. What was what were some of um, your fears at the time uh, going through that? Cause you said it was the scariest time of your life. What were some of your fears of what, what would happen based off this diagnosis? Yeah, I mean, I didn't know how rapidly this would progress. I mean, clearly there was something awry with my mom's brain function, but I didn't, you know, what I knew about Alzheimer's disease was that it was a disease that affected old people. So when my mom was, and, and really carried them to their graves. So when my mom was prescribed drugs for Alzheimer's disease, um, I was terrified that my mom was going to die um, young and that she was going to forget who I was. I mean, these are all the questions yeah. that were circling my head, almost like carry on birds, you know, like I, I just like felt like um, 
it was, you know, my ignorance and the fear and the helplessness and the, the sort of bleakness that I experienced in those doctor's offices with my mom. When you go to those doctor's offices for answers, I received anything, but mm -hmm. it just felt like my world was closing in on me. And, um, for better or worse, you know, my mom never learned how to use a computer. So my mom, my mom didn't know how to use the internet or anything like that. So she wasn't privy to this information. Uh, I was in that, in that hotel in Ohio at the time, I was like manically Googling and reading anything that I could find on both Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. And really it affected me in that moment worse than, than it affected her. I mean, she, ignorance was bliss for her. For me, I was reading phrases like, you know, the drugs have no disease modifying ability. Um, Alzheimer's disease is an incurable condition. Parkinson's disease is, is an incurable condition. Most patients with Parkinson's disease end up passing because they lose the ability to swallow. So they end up choking mm. actually. Um, I was like, is that going to happen to my mom? Yeah, it's, it's really horrific. And and my mom, even in, in Ohio, wasn't able to get a, a clear diagnosis because she had symptoms of both conditions. Mm. And so for me, it was like, as soon as the, the emotional turmoil subsided for me, it became a very strong call to action to learn whatever I could about the science and mechanisms underlying these conditions. And I, even in those you know early uh, months, I didn't have any professional aspiration. Um, I certainly, you know, really just wanted to, wanted the information. Um, but at a certain point I stumbled upon the shocking insight that, uh, these conditions often begin in the brain decades before the first symptom. Mm. And for me, that became a very, uh, clear impetus to begin sharing the information that I was learning. Yeah. What was some of the talk of the doctors to you? You said that it, there wasn't any answers really. What were the doctors saying? Was there any hope? from this or what were the, what were the doctors telling you at the time? No, I mean, I, I've coined my experience mm. diagnose and adios because mm. oftentimes, I mean, given the current healthcare climate, you're lucky if you get 15 minutes mm -hmm. with your attending physician, they write, you know, they scribble a few lines on a prescription pad and they send you on your way. Mm. It's really up to you, the family member to learn about the condition and you know, I was highly motivated. I had a background in journalism, so I knew immediately where to go for uh, information. I dug right into PubMed, which is where I would go whenever I wanted any kind of health information. I went to the primary literature and began there reading the introductions and discussions and conclusions of all the research papers. I went to, um, you know, university websites to look at the press releases for research. Um, I started watching TED Talks, reading books. Um, occasionally, you know, articles, I mean, I literally, uh, night and day, it's what I ate, breathed, mm -hmm. uh, um, about just, just the science and connecting those dots. And ultimately I, uh, had the revelation that I had something given my media background that few other people have, and that is media credentials, a calling card as a journalist. Yeah. It was almost like my superpower that. I used to reach out to researchers and scientists around the globe. So after doing my initial research, I kind of had a, a, you know, enough of an understanding where I was able to communicate with these scientists and clinicians, um, in a way that, uh, you know, my, my knowledge and my understanding really advanced exponentially at that point, because I had this, this framework and then I started having these conversations and, um, I mean, that's why I think, you know, a couple of years ago, it gave me enough, it gave me the tools to really set out on the book writing process. Yeah. So what kind of things were you finding in the research that gave you this hope to do what you do today and writing a book about it? What, what were you finding in the yeah. research that you weren't hearing from the doctors? Yeah. Well, I mean, the link between brain health and metabolic health was one of the first uh, insights that I stumbled upon. Mm. You know, today, if you have type 2 diabetes, your risk for developing Alzheimer's disease increases anywhere between two and fourfold. Wow. And so, you know, these are dots that really you're only able to connect when you can zoom out. And the problem is um, modern medicine takes a reductionist approach, meaning that these specialists really are trained only to focus on their areas of uh, treatment, for example. 
So a neurologist today, you know, first of all, we know that nutrition is undertaught in medical school, right? And meanwhile, nutrition is so important when it comes to preventing type 2 diabetes and even treating type 2 diabetes. But it's generally undertaught in medical school. And then you take a profession or, or a specialty like neurology, where 90% of what we know about the most common neurological uh, neurodegenerative disease has been discovered only in the past um, 15 years. They know next to nothing about nutrition and particularly the link between nutrition and brain disease. So I began looking at what um, helps foster metabolic health in the body, knowing that type 2 diabetes is driven uh, in, in many regards by diet and lifestyle. And I, um, you know, I started looking there. I also discovered that, um, at the time, a, a niche subset of, um, clinicians and scientists were beginning to consider Alzheimer's disease as a form of diabetes of the brain to the degree that it's now being called type three diabetes. And when I began this research about five years ago, it was really mentioned only in about a handful of papers, uh, but it's really gained widespread adoption, I think, over the past couple of years, in part because the prevailing wisdom over the past couple of decades that Alzheimer's disease is caused by a buildup of plaque in the brain really hasn't led to any answers in terms of a therapeutic treatment. Um, meanwhile, interventions that improve the metabolic health of the body seem to um, improve cognitive function and certainly uh, minima, help minimize your risk for developing the condition. So I started looking at what are, the, what are the kinds of foods and what's the type of diet that we need to eat to really foster metabolic health in the body. And I became interested in, in low carb dieting um, and really uh, looking for foods that are uh, nutrient dense and provide the brain the building blocks and raw materials that it needs to perform optimally and help fend off against conditions like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And so what, <clears throat> I guess, well, that's what we'll get into with your book, Genius Foods, is, you know, what are those specific foods? And then how did all of this research start um, helping out your mom specifically, right? Because that, yeah. that was the why behind all of this. Did you start yeah. implementing these things by yourself to help your mom or what, you know, related yeah. to your mom's story too? Yeah, totally. Um, I think initially I became uh, very adamant about changing my mom's diet. I was sort of like a nutrition Nazi in, in the house. <laughs> um, and I, I tried really hard to put my mom on because my mom was already symptomatic. So I tried uh, really hard to put my mom on a sort of ketogenic diet. Um, but to be totally honest, that didn't go very well uh, in terms of um, her adherence to it. I think I was able to keep her on it for about a week. Um, <laughs> But the problem is, and my mom doesn't uh, necessarily have Alzheimer's disease. She has another form of dementia. But um, Alzheimer's disease being the most common form of it is the most studied form of dementia. Mm -hmm. And when people develop Alzheimer's disease, there's a shift in food preference where they begin to crave uh, starchier, sweeter foods. And it's uh, theorized that this is meant be, you know, as a way of supplying cheap energy to the brain, which becomes... Um, basically unable to create ATP out of sugar. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, well, all throughout the condition essentially, and particularly in its later stages. So keeping my mom on a low carb diet was really difficult because my mom actually began to crave and still, uh, has a sweet tooth. And in tandem with that, I started to realize that, um, you know, the, the way to lead uh, loved ones to dietary change is really to teach, but to teach gently. You know, I, I started to notice that I um, would get angry whenever I'd be at my mom's house and I would notice an open bag of potato chips or a box of cookies. And uh, I didn't want that to affect certainly not my mom's quality of life, um, but also my relationship with my mom. The last thing that I would ever want my mom to feel, uh, you know, around her condition and her impulses is shame. Yeah. And so I realized that I had to teach more gently. And so today, you know, I think my mom has learned a bit about my dietary recommendations. I think she's eating more greens and things like that. Certainly, I've gotten rid of all the unhealthy fats uh, in her kitchen, but uh, she pretty much eats what she wants. Um, and yeah, I mean, I wish I could say that I've reversed the condition. Yeah. Um, I have. But I also, you know, I became really passionate about prevention. Yeah, that's really what 
where my, my, my passion lies because today I think people can be a little bit careless about, um, you know, uh, the hope that they instill, especially in the wellness world. And even with some highly credentialed, uh, you know, best-selling author types that I think, you know, um, you're, you're probably familiar with. I think people tend to, I've heard the word reversal thrown around when it comes to these conditions. And I, there's no, I've seen no quality evidence to say that we can reverse any of these conditions. Um, especially knowing that they begin in the brain decades before the first symptom. To me, it's become very clear that this is a condition that we really need to prevent if we're going to make a dent, um, in the, in, you know, the, the rates of incidence. And, and I think that's also where my, where my power lies because I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not wearing a lab coat. I'm not this, you know, 60 year old guy. I want to reach young people, you know, and to dispel those myths like that, you know, these conditions are old people's conditions and, and whatnot. So really it's, it's, for me, it's about prevention. Yeah. <clears throat> and I agree with that 100%. And, you know, I can totally relate, <clears throat> you know, sometimes we, you know, can have all the knowledge in the world, but if we, and we want to take care of those ones that we love so much, right? And we're just like, oh, it's so easy. If you just fix this, then it'll all be changed and you'll, it'll all be good. And I wish, you know, everyone could see it that way, but sometimes you got to let people live their life. And you know, the more you try and force it, the more resistance sometimes you get. And uh, like you said, you don't want your mom to, to feel that shame, you know, in her later years of life. And um, I think that's, that's, a, that's an interesting balance, you know, even someone like you, Max, that that has to deal with that. That's very relatable to your average person that maybe is trying to care for their mom or dad, like, Hey, let's make some healthier choices or uh, maybe a spouse or someone like that. So um, I think that's really interesting. And then also getting back to um, the whole uh, prevention thing, you know, you reaching younger kids, like I think that's, that's very smart because I think that's where we're going to make the biggest change in the long run is to start teaching, you know, our generation and the generation before us making these changes beforehand rather than waiting till a symptom happens. And then it's like, okay, well, I better change now. <laughs> exactly. It's almost too late. Exactly. I mean, you know, it's sort of like that, uh, there's an amazing saying, you know, when, when was the best, when is the best time to plant a tree? Mm -hmm. 20 years ago. 20 years ago. <laughs> When's the second best time? Today. Right now. Right. Right. So, I mean, that's to me, that's like when the, the same thing could be said for prevention and, and making dietary change. Like, granted, you know, um, these conditions often, uh, especially the conditions that are that really seem to be burdening modern society, these non communicable chronic diseases, um, they don't start overnight. And so, you know, the earlier we can begin to really clean up our diets and improve our lifestyles, uh, the better off we're going to be. But even if you you know, haven't yet um, made that change and you feel like you're on the wrong path, you're always one meal away from getting right back on that path and changing your diet. You know, one of my favorite lines from uh, one of my favorite movies, Vanilla Sky, is every passing minute is another chance to turn it all around. Yeah. And I, I put that quote in my book, actually, because I think it's so powerful and it's so true when it comes to our health. Yeah. Um, it's, it's really never um, too late yeah. to to make at least some impact on your health, yeah. but it's always better to start earlier. Yeah, I agree with that 100%. Um, let's dive right into genius foods. Let's start off with actually talking about what are the worst foods that you can, I think it might be obvious for some people, but let's talk about the worst foods that um, can cause damage to your brain, brain. Because I think the majority of society is uneducated on this and they don't see that correlation between the foods you eat affecting your brain. We just think, oh, it's it's, uh, it's, it's, it has nothing to do with diet, but let's talk about that first. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I began looking at the foods that I, that I grew up with mm -hmm. and, you know, I grew up consuming foods like margarine, um, snack ball cookies, low fat, cholesterol free cookies, egg whites, uh, things like that. And, you know, I, my, my family, we grew up, I grew up in New York city and so we had access to healthy food, you know, unfortunately families these days. Uh, live in what are called food deserts where they have to do their supermarket shopping at gas stations, essentially. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that wasn't me. I grew up in New York City. I had access to healthy food. And the foods that I that my family thought to be healthy back in the 80s and 90s were low-fat, fat-free, hyper-processed foods. So, you know, my favorite uh, way to top bread was with margarine, you know, that came in those pale yellow tubs. And, um, and I didn't have my first egg until I was about 12 or 13 years old because 
you know, my family, we always considered egg yolks to be unhealthy because of the cholesterol contained in the yolks. Um, always by the stove, we had that uh, tub of corn oil, which uh, I remember distinctly, my mom and grandma frying chicken cutlets in. Mm-hmm. And um, so when it comes to, you know, the worst foods for brain health, it's really these these exact kinds of foods, the corn oil, the soybean oil, the, the, the grain and seed oils that we've been told for the past couple of decades um, are good for us. They're, these oils are highly processed. They have to go through an assembly line of processing in order to make it to market. And many of these, uh, many of these uh, steps in the production process uh, damage the oil to pretty astonishing degrees. So, for example, all vegetable oils undergo a process called deodorization, mm-hmm. which creates trans fats. So we now know that there is no safe level of trans fat consumption. And yet all of these grain and seed oils that line our supermarket shelves, even at Whole Foods, yeah. for example, um, contain up to 5% trans fats. These fats damage our cardiovascular health. They drive inflammation. And we now know that they impair memory even in young and healthy people. They're related to an increased risk in all-cause mortality, whereas the latest research shows that not even saturated fat the kind of fat that we've been told for decades is really, you know, the boogeyman hiding in our butter yeah. has any relationship with uh, an increased risk and in all cause mortality. So these grain and seed oils really are among the worst offenders in the in the modern food supply. And they're really squeezed into every crevice of the supermarket these days. I mean, one of the reasons why they're so processed, um, it's so that they become tasteless and odorless. Mm-hmm. And manufacturers love this because, you know, they're not only cheap. But they're able to use them in a broad range of processed packaged foods. So, you know, you'll find these, you know, like canola oil, for example, you'll find it in everything from salad dressing to granola bars. How is it that the same oil could be used in both of those kinds of foods, which have such dramatically different flavors? Well, because they're so refined and so processed so as not to have any flavor. Yeah. Um, I also talk about the dangers of uh, eating um, processed refined carbohydrates. Um, because they keep an ancestral hormone in our bodies called insulin chronically elevated. 40% of Alzheimer's cases might be owed to chronically elevated insulin alone. Mm. And I talk about the mechanisms underlying this, uh, this estimate in genius foods. Um, but really it's about getting back to a, a, a diet that is lower in starch and sugar and higher in nutrient dense whole foods, um, fibrous vegetables and, nutrient dense, um, animal products. You know, I'm not a, I don't advocate for a a vegan diet. I don't think from the perspective of brain health, uh, that's ideal. And so I advocate for the consumption of, um, you know, grass fed, uh, meat, pastured eggs, things like that. Um, big fan of vegetables. Uh, so, you know, I think people in nutrition tend to think in terms of black or white, you know, especially now we're seeing, uh, this, this trend of the carnivorous diet, yeah. You know, sort of sprouting up. I'm a huge fan of vegetables. I think, um, you know, there's there's zero research on on carnivore carnivorous diets in humans. Um, and yet the latest uh, and most robust meta analysis I've seen of observational studies um, points towards fiber as being beneficial to health um, and longevity. So, uh yeah, so it's all, for me, it's all about including dark leafy greens, vegetables, cruciferous veggies, things like that, and properly raised meat products. Yeah. So would you consider it ketogenic or is it – would you do not want to put a label on it and just basically those types of vegetables, those types of meats? Yeah. You know, I definitely – I take a food-focused approach. So when you're eating my diet, inevitably you're going to be in what I – uh, advocate for, which is intermittent ketosis. Mm, One of your okay. previous podcasts, I feel like, was on cyclical ketogenic diets, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I advocate for intermittent ketosis. I don't think that chronic ketosis is uh, any wiser from an evolutionary standpoint as being chronically out of ketosis. Yeah. Um, so I think it's you know when you're metabolically flexible and you're and you're eating a, a you know a, a naturally healthy, lower carbohydrate, more nutrient dense diet, and you're exercising. Uh, a lot, you are naturally going to oscillate like a fan in between, you know, into and out of ketosis. And I think that that's, um, you know, from a metabolic perspective and certainly from an evolutionary perspective, uh, to me, that makes the most sense. And why I think ketosis is so uh, important when it comes to the brain is we now know that 
uh, ketones are sort of like an anti-aging fuel source for the brain. Um, they could be considered that because they generate fewer free radicals um, in their conversion to ATP than glucose, but they also act in the brain like a signaling molecule, increasing production of endogenous antioxidants like glutathione, um, and also turning on special uh, miracle growth proteins like BDNF. So in many ways, it could almost be said that when your brain is using fat for fuel, it's not aging. And yeah. so that's why I think it's so important. Yeah. So. And no, and I, I agree with that. And um, I'm a big fan of the ketogenic diet, but I agree with you as far as from an evolutionary perspective and being metabolic, metabolically flexible, like you mentioned, you know, I think for most people, you know, it makes sense to like intermittent, you know, do an intermittent uh, type of ketogenic ketosis, diet. Yeah. yeah, I like that. That's that's very smart, and it seems like to make the most sense these days. Um, what are like? And in, in, I don't know if you go into this in the book because I actually haven't read it. But do you go into specific superfoods of of these like these top three foods are the best for your brain? Do you go into specifics of which ones are are better? Absolutely, yes. Cool. That's actually so. So I've co-opted the term superfood, cool. Which um, you know is something that really was created by marketers. It's not a scientific yeah. term, but. <laughs> But it's powerful, yeah. right? So I've co-opted the term superfood, and that's actually why my book is called Genius Foods, because my book is all about highlighting the foods that people should eat more of that have a robust body of evidence to say these foods can improve your brain health. So just to go through a few of them, um, avocados are certainly a genius food. They contain an abundance of healthy fats and fat-protecting antioxidants, which are really good for brain health because your brain is constructed of fat. So fat-protecting, fat-soluble, Lipophilic antioxidants are of particular relevance to your brain, which is constructed largely of fat and particularly a very uh, damage prone kind of fat called polyunsaturated fat. So avocados are incredible. I talk about low sugar fruits like uh, blueberries um, and strawberries and other kinds of berries. Berries all um, are what I would consider genius foods, but especially blueberries. There's a pretty strong body of evidence um, on anthocyanins and how they are, can actually accumulate in the brain's memory center where they help it fend off against oxidative stress and uh, you know the insults of aging and things like that. They can reduce cognitive aging by about two and a half years, studies show, gotcha. uh, when you consume about a serving um, or more a week. Uh, I talk about eggs, as I mentioned. You know, when an embryo is developing, one of the first structures to assemble is the nervous system, which includes the brain. So an egg yolk is literally nature's multivitamin containing all of the ingredients required to grow a healthy brain. Um, fatty fish. I was just interviewing, uh, actually for my podcast, The Genius Life, uh, Dr. William Sears, who's an expert on um, astaxanthin, which is one of the compounds in wild salmon that I'm a huge fan of, um, can protect the skin, eyes, brain, uh, can, you know, boost neuroplasticity, reduce inflammation, things like that. So wild salmon is a, is a, is a genius food along with other fatty fish like sardines, mackerel, things like that. Um, and then, yeah, I basically, I highlight the foods that I think people should just buy on loop. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make it I, easy. I basically, yeah. Make it easy. I give you the shopping list. Okay. And what about supplementation? Are you a big fan of nootropics or, uh, you know, smart drugs or, you know, it, it, you know, fish oil or krill oil or other supplements that you think are good for the brain? Yeah. I'm a fan of krill oil because of the unique format of DHA fat found in krill oil, which is, um, you know, it's, uh, it's in its phospholipid form, which is, I guess the membrane equivalent, uh, form of DHA. Mm -hmm. Um, when DHA is integrated in your, into your brain cells, um, it basically constitutes the phospholipid bilayer, which is what a neuronal membrane is essentially made of. And these, these, these phospholipids allow um, receptors for neurotransmitters to bob up to the surface and sort of act like the ears to the neuron. And so when you're consuming krill oil, you're getting DHA already in that phospholipid format. Um, as opposed to fish oil and, uh, fish oil basically has, uh, DHA and EPA in the triglyceride form, which is most commonly, uh, you know, the format that you're going to get these fatty acids in when you eat things like fish, but the unique format in krill oil, I think, you know, there's not as much evidence. Um, but I think it's probably, uh, you know, a, a beneficial thing. 
the science really has yet to be borne out, but in terms of sort of hedging my bets, um, I'll take it occasionally. Okay. And um, I'm a big believer in vitamin D supplementation. Um, and, you know, for people that are traveling on the road that just want to sort of um, bolster up their diet, I'm a fan of supplements. I mean, you know, I, my, my first foray into um, fitness and nutrition was actually – through my fascination for supplementation. So yeah, I would say that I'm, I'm pretty, uh, for them. Okay. You know, supple supplementing, supplementing wisely. Gotcha. But what about specifics as far as like nootropics or these smart drugs for your brain? Have you yeah. looked into those at all? Are you a fan of those or if so, which ones or not, uh, not really. Okay. Um, you know, I feel like most of the time there's just like a ton of caffeine in them. <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think for most people that are going to spend their hard-earned money on those kinds of supplements, there's often low-hanging fruit in their diets and their lifestyles that they're not exploiting um, that are going to provide a far greater uh, cognitive impact, you know, with a lot more bang for the buck. Yeah. So, you know, cleaning up the diet, eating the genius foods, exercising a little bit more, being more active, maybe getting rid of stress, I think those are going to help. Uh, both acutely and in the long term, far more than any of these uh, cognitive boosting supplements. When it comes to um, food-based supplements and specific micronutrients, you know, I'm definitely uh, a fan. But I think in terms of those like nootropic supplements, no, I wouldn't recommend any of them. Okay. What is a uh, what's a typical day of food look like for you if you follow the Genius Food uh, program? Yeah. So you when I wake like up, a whole day. Yeah. When I wake up in the morning, usually I um, won't eat for two to three hours after I wake up. Uh, I'll usually drink a cup of black coffee, um, water. If I'm doing a particularly low carb version of my uh, diet, I'll throw some uh, mineral salt uh, into my water to replace some of those electrolytes. We all tend to wake up a little bit dehydrated, but when your insulin is low and particularly when you're on a low carb diet, your kidneys uh, spill sodium. So I like to replace that with, um, you know, some, some salt, some Himalayan pink salt or uh, real salt from this. Actually, Redmond is based in Utah. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I just met with them yesterday. <laughs> oh, that's so yeah, cool. Small, small world. Yeah. They're a good company. Yeah. They're, yeah. So I have no, no affiliation with them, but yeah. I really, really enjoy their salt. Okay. Um, so I'll sprinkle that in my water, drink some black coffee. An hour or two or three after I wake up, usually I'll have my first meal. I like to have uh, what I call a huge fatty salad every single day. It's one of the rules that I set forth in Genius, Food, in Genius Foods. Um, Rush University research uh, has shown that people who consume a large bowl of dark leafy greens every single day have brains that look up to 11 years younger wow. on scans. So every day I'm trying to have uh, you know, a, a big salad in whatever form that takes. And so usually <laughs> that's what I'll break my fast with. Um, some of the most valuable micronutrients in these greens are fat soluble. Um, so I always, uh, you know, I try to make it a fatty salad by putting lots of extra virgin olive oil on it and then some protein. Protein is the most satiating micronutrient. I also love to lift weights. So, you know, I'm trying to hit, uh, a certain protein intake that facilitates, um, you know, gaining lean mass. And, uh, you know, so chicken, grass fed steak, fish, an egg, something like that. Mm -hmm. And usually I won't eat again until dinner, um, especially if I'm out and about. If, if I'm in the house, I'll end up snacking on things like dark chocolate, nuts, um, maybe an avocado, uh, things like that. Um, but then, yeah, over the course of the day, maybe I'll hit the sauna, do some cryo. Uh, I'm a big fan of cold plunges. Um, Cold plunges are amazing. So, you know, both in New York and L.A., I've got my places where they have like these cold uh, <laughs> pools, basically, that get, that get pretty cold. Yeah. So I try to, along with my physical, uh, you know, exercise, I try to get some thermal exercise in. So whether it's cryo or sauna, um, always doing that uh, at least once a day. And then, yeah, for dinner, I'll have another, you know, either grass-fed uh, burger patty or grass-fed steak or you know, some wild salmon, chicken drumsticks. I'm a big fan of chicken legs. They have a lot of collagen, which I think is really important. I think we've, we've got a biological imperative to not be wasteful. Mm -hmm. So I try to eat like as many, uh, you know, varied parts of the animal mm -hmm. as I can. 
and roast up some more vegetables. So right now I'm kind of obsessed with cauliflower. You know, some days I'll go for the Brussels sprouts. Um, but for me, it's always about, uh, you know, getting both, um, high quality protein, um, and all the macronutrients that those, you, you know, those, uh, foods usually come with and tons and tons of vegetables. Yeah. So you're not too strict about tracking or testing blood ketones or those types of things oh. or, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I tend to think that, you know, chasing that keto high score, uh, <laughs> is kind of a, kind of a waste of time. Um, you know, for me subjectively, I don't usually feel hungry, you know, I eat, uh, when I want to. And, um, sometimes when I feel hunger pangs, I could tell, you know, usually it, that for me correlates with not having slept well the night before, or maybe having eaten, uh, you know, maybe a few too many carbs the previous day. But, um, but no, I'm not, I'm not really into the whole, you know, I think it's, I think it's more valuable as a skill to learn to tap into your own body and gain a subjective sense of, um, sort of how your engine is revving. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, I do. Um, you know, to, to, to finish up, one of my favorite quotes is from Tony Robbins, uh, and that's success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Uh, Max, mm. for you, what are the things in life that bring you the most fulfillment? Man, you know, I think like <laughs> lately it's been getting to connect with awesome people like yourself. Thank you. I mean, that's been, that's been really cool for me, especially, you know, after I launched my own podcast. Yeah. I love, um, you know, I just love getting notes from people all over the world that Genius Foods is helping them. Mm. Um, people report to me that they're sleeping better. They're waking up without alarm clocks, um, you know, at the appropriate time. They are losing weight. They, you know, brain fog is lifted. They're feeling happier, less anxious, all because of my book. And to me, that's really the most gratifying thing because, you know, initially this was all, obviously we talked about this motivated by my mom. Yes. And it's something that continues to be, painful and, and, you know, I love my mom to death, but to me, the fact that, that my work is now able to reach and impact so many people for the better to me is a way of it, you know, all of this, uh, you know, and what my mom is going through having it not be in vain. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so to me, that's the most gratifying hmm. thing, you know, I, I mean, I mean, it's, it's a 16 to $18 investment that anybody can make. And, you know, I just think it's, uh, yeah, I just love seeing it get out there. Yeah. Know? I love that, man. So Thanks cool. so much. Um, what is, what's your favorite book that you've read recently that's made the biggest impact for you? That's, you know, we'll just do one book. <laughs> oh man. Well, actually it's not going to be the kind of book that you expect. Okay. Um, I was, uh, cause it's, cause I'm currently reading it. It's called the disaster artist and it was recently made into a movie. Okay. Yeah. I've, I haven't seen the movie, but I've seen it out there. Okay. Yeah. 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 It's basically, um, you probably expected like a health or science. Textbook or something like, that. Yeah. like sure. It's, uh, it's basically about, um, you know, making it, uh, in an industry Hollywood that, um, has the odds continually stacked against you and just following your vision, uh, um, odds and really, uh, not giving into fear. And I relate to that a lot, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's a book that, that, that people should read, you know, no matter what industry you're in the disaster artist, it's great. And also see the movie It recently became a movie and it's one of my favorite movies of the past couple of years. Cool. I'll have to check out the movie. I didn't know there was a book about it too. So <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> well, it was made off of the book. The book came out first. That's so, so cool. It was really good. So yeah. that last question for you, where do you go from here? Do you love the health and wellness space? Do you see yourself going back to the, the media world or Hollywood? Or do you kind of see maybe, um, you know, or where do you see, where do you see yourself going from here now that you've wrote, written Genius Foods? Yeah. No, I think the health and wellness world, I love it. You know, I'm just like everything about it from, you know, now being able to try out products, you know, that people are making to, um, you know, I realize how much I love writing books, um, over the course of writing genius food. So yeah, I definitely, you know, I feel like I've planted my flag in the space and I intend to stay in it for a long, for a long time. But that being said, I love media. So I'm, yeah. I'm looking to kind of expand my podcast <laughs> and, uh, you know, pursue other opportunities, um, in the media space, but I'm always going to have a foot, uh, in health and wellness for sure. I just, okay. I love it too much. And I also feel that people really need, 
sort of a guiding voice, you know, and I'm just, I'm one of many, yeah. but, um, but, uh, but I really enjoy it. And, um, yeah, so I am to stay in it for a long time. Cool. Uh, thanks Max. Where can people, you know, connect with you on social media? First of all, I guess, Hey, your Instagram is super inter- entertaining. So everyone that's listening or watching, go follow Max on Instagram, super good content. So where can people find you on, on social media, your website and your book? Thanks Drew. Yeah. yeah. Instagram at Max Lugavere. Um, M A X L U G A V as in Victor E R E. Um, also you can, uh, join my newsletter at maxlugavere.com. You can go to geniusfoodsbook.com to download a free sample chapter of my book. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm pretty out there. So come say hi. Cool. Thanks again, Max. Really appreciate what you do, man. Um, and much respect to you and looking forward to connecting with you hopefully in person one day. So thanks, thanks for coming on, man. 